started. I think there might be a couple people sneaking back around the corner. They might be hiding over by the, the coffee pot. Yeah, there's a few of them. Um, a couple things I just wanted to remind people as we're gathering back in here. There are a couple upcoming events that you might find useful. That If you haven't heard the crop production clinics next week, uh, there's one in La Vista on Tuesday. And then next Thursday, there's one in York. So it's kind of the two close ones here. Um, and we're also having a, um, a two-day uh, farm transition and succession workshop. Uh, January 20, January 23rd is day one, and then March 5th is the second day. So we leave about six weeks in between to kind of get some things done, homework, if you will. Uh, but there will be a couple uh, lawyers and accountants and farm planning folks be at that event. So if you have any interest in transitioning your farm, whether you, you know who that person is going to take over or uh, you don't know who that person is going to take over, we're going to kind of run two tracks on that day. So if you have a son coming back or a daughter coming back, or if you have no idea what to do with it, kind of have two different areas. So anyway, it's a pretty good program. Uh, if you have interest in that, you can see me or uh, stop at the office. They'll have a little info on that. So uh, that's it. That's all the, the plugs for that. So um, go ahead and uh, introduce our next speaker, uh, Stephen Bainziger. He's a professor of agronomy on campus, a small grains breeder. And I actually took a genetics class. You probably did, don't remember this, but Way back when, uh, all of my genetics and breeding knowledge that I have came from him. So it's uh, um, anyway. So we're glad to have him. Uh, you, you know, he's done a lot of work in wheat, but also in barley. So um, we'll again ask questions as we come along the way, and I'll I'll turn the uh, the floor over to him. Okay. Well, we'll see. Did I get the mic on? Yeah, it's light green. We're good. Okay. Thank you. Well, first of all, I want to thank you for coming, and I want to thank Tyler for inviting me. Uh, when he said he learned all his genetics from me, now I'm really worried about retention. That's the thing that scares the death out of every professor, okay? But uh, when you see me, you'll understand the worries of retention anyway. So we're gonna talk about barley, and a, a couple things I'd like to start off with right off the bat. We have our major barley effort just at 84th and Havelock. And if you ever wanna see what barley looks like, just come on out, you know, let me know. You know, it's, it's uh, usually on the north side of the road, I guess with the, the changes to the Lancaster Event Center, the road's kind of screwed up, but, but you're more than welcome to come out and see it. You can see the wheat program and you can see the other crop I work on, which is winter triticale. All of our winter wheat, winter barley, winter triticale. But you're always welcome. There's, you know, it's, we have nothing to hide, nothing secret, anything like that. And if you just want to get a feel for something before you jump in, feel free to do it. So today we're gonna to talk about barley. Now barley's near and dear to my heart because I've, well, I've worked on barley for 40 years, I guess is what it amounts to. So with that, the title is everything you wanted to know about barley, but you were afraid to ask. So you can ask and you can interrupt. And I'll try to remember to repeat the question because I have to do that in my class because I teach at resident and distance and the distance students can't hear the question in the classrooms. So what are the topics? And I would like to, to thank my sponsors because in barley where the money really is is in beer okay so we have a grant from the brewers association we have a grant from the american malting barley association and by the way that's the original budweiser from germany i found that over once when i was traveling and i thought it might be worthwhile getting a picture and the like so the take-home points are really what you need to know okay as a grower you know where did barley originate few more things about barley, and then a little bit about breeding barley. And I want to give you some of our data because, you know, barley is sort of a, there's not a lot of us in the Great Plains is what it amounts to. So I want you to be able to see real data. You can get an idea of how it's done and that type of thing. Okay. So the number one concern with barley, if it's winter barley, is surviving the winter. Okay. And... If you work with cereals, small grain cereals, winter oats are the most winter tender, okay? They would almost guarantee be killed in Nebraska, okay? But you'll see them grown in the southeast. They're in North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, those kind of climates, okay? Uh, winter barley is next, okay? So we actually have adequate levels of winter hardiness for most years. But if you bring seed from other places, you always have to make sure it can grow here. That's the number one thing. Then there's winter triticale, and that rarely gets winter killed anymore. Winter wheat, which almost never gets winter killed, 
especially under our more warming trends, it seems right now. And then the most winter hardy cereal of all is winter rye. Okay. And so a lot of people I heard earlier were talking about how their rotation had rye in it. It's because you can plant it late and it still survives. It's a tough crop. It's a really tough crop. For those of you that are unfamiliar, winter triticale is a cross between bar, uh, between winter rye and winter durum. Okay. So it's got a little bit of the rye in it, but it didn't get that great winter hardiness. Okay. Never think triticale is as good as rye. Okay. If barley survives the winter, the number one thing I worry about is smut. Okay. And, but otherwise it has almost no diseases. I mean, it's, it's, the diseases that barley gets in the east aren't prevalent in the west, I think, because of our dryness. Okay? The only other one would be barley yellow dwarf virus, which is an aphid transmitted virus, makes the plant turn yellow. But you will see that in any small grains. If you see it in oats, it turns the plant red, basically. It bleaches out the chlorophyll. And what happens after that is you see whatever pigment that's underneath it. So in oats, it almost always turns red because they have a lot of anthocyanin. If you see it in wheat, it can turn yellow or it can turn red because we have both in, in different varieties of wheat. In barley, it almost always turns a yellow and it's a premature yellowing. Uh, the way you'll see it is it's brought in by an aphid. Usually the aphid lands. You will see like a point and then there'll be a circle coming out. So you see in your field like this circular dip, you know, sort of depending on how far the aphid and its progeny move, they're parthenogenic, which means they self-produce. And you'll just see like a little circle and it'll start at the same height as the field and then it goes down to the epicenter, which is where the, the aphid first landed. Barley yellow dwarf doesn't really bother me nearly as much as smut. And I've seen smut in as much of 10% of a field. You, it's extremely easily treated with a seed treatment. And for barley, I don't recommend ever growing barley without a seed treatment, especially if you're going to keep your own seed, okay? To me, it's the cheapest thing. You know, Leo, I mean, I usually think a buck to two bucks a, a unit, right? So you're looking at, you know, and in barley, a unit is 48 pounds or a bushel would be 48 pounds. So, and you probably plant, you know, a bushel to a bushel and a half, depending on how much seeding rates. We usually go about a bushel. You're looking at one to two dollars and you could lose 10% of your yield. So to me, seed treatments are just a no brainer. Okay. Barley must be harvested on time, okay? It's a very unforgiving crop. It basically will pop out of the ground, put everything into its growth, and when it gets ready to finish, everything goes to the seed, and there's virtually nothing left in the plant, which means that if you get a hard rainstorm, two things will occur. One is the head will literally snap. It's on a very thin stem, and that stem is now empty, okay? So it can snap off, or you'll put the field flat. Barley does not have the straw strength of winter wheat, okay? So those are the things. When, you, when it's ripe, get it off the field, especially in eastern Nebraska. Western Nebraska, where it's drier, you don't seem to have those. You're, you're going to have either a storm that's going to come with hail, in which case there's nothing you can do, or you're going to miss it, in which case you don't really need super straw strength, okay? You also have a choice in this part of the world of growing winter barley or spring barley, and that'll depend upon what your interest is, okay? I only breed winter barley because for us, the yield is a little bit higher, and so therefore, I always breed for the yield. But if you, there are good reasons for growing spring barley if you have the right rotations and things like that, too. Most of the barley research is in spring barley, okay? So... What is the market for barley? And, and I, I really appreciated Nathan's comment because the first thing you got to start with is the market. Well, in, in barley, what you have to think about is you have a plan A, then you have a plan B, then a plan C, then a plan D, okay? So the market includes forage and cover crops. And that's probably one of the main uses right now is cover crop, but also forages. I was talking to a grower and cattle love grazing barley. As you go further south of here, probably a third of all the barley that's planted is grazed out, okay? It's because it's a very good 
animal feed. It's a little softer from what I gather on their mouth than compared to a wheat. And so they really like it. They particularly like it for dairies, okay, and weanling, steer, uh, weanling steers, okay? It's also used as a feed grain. That's probably what I got into the business for was to use it for feed. And, you know, my predecessor, John Schmidt, started breeding barley or continued breeding barley because we've had about 80 years, 90 years of barley breeding at the University of Nebraska because Western Nebraska was feed grain deficient and winter barley would fit to meet those needs. Now it's not so much with all the corn that's being grown, okay? There's malting barley and anybody not know what malting barley is used for? So how many of you grown barley? Okay, how many of you had a beer? Okay, so there's a, there's a lot, of, lot of potential growth, right? <laughs> I'm gonna ask if you like beer because we don't wanna put anybody on the spot, okay? There's also hullus barley, which is what you're going to see in your barley beef stew, uh, soups. That's, that's the barley without the glooms or the leaves attached to the seed. It's free threshing just like wheat. That's a good thing and a bad thing. The bad part is that it hurts seed germination because the embryo or the germ is exposed without the hulls on it. And so you have to really process it carefully. If you have hulled barley, or the ones with the leaves, lemon paleo hanging onto it, it's a buffer against any of the equipment that you're using to, to thrash it, okay? Now, the key thing that you have in barley, if you're gonna go from malting barley, is everybody thinks of it only as beer. We're gonna use the malt extract, we're gonna make it for beer, that's extremely high value. The amount of extract that you use in a, in a um, beer will depend on the type of beer, but usually it's somewhere between one bushel to two bushels per keg. Now, does that sound like we're using metric units? One to two bushels per keg, which is 33 gallons, okay? Anyway, but for your sake, you know, when you think about, we got all these crafts breweries, you think about how many gallons they are producing a beer, we could pretty easily flood the malt market if we wanted to grow thousands of acres of barley. But the point is, is if your barley doesn't make specifications, and, and the maltsters, because it's the highest value, normally spend an awful lot of time looking at the barley, though we have some really good craft brewers here that are, are really great to work with and great to work with the growers, okay? But the point is, is that if it doesn't make malting barley specs, you still have a lot of malting products, right? Ever heard of a, you know, going to the store to get a malt? Well, that's malt from barley, right? So in the malt chain, value chain, you know, beer is probably the highest, but then there's malt for other products like milkshakes and things like this, right? So there is malt that's used for a lot of different other products. So there is a way of, staying within the value of a malted barley, that doesn't necessarily mean you have to go to, to beer, okay? If you're anyone working with malt, and specifically in beers, the number one disease, which fortunately we rarely see here, and this is why we have a growth opportunity, is fusarium head blight or scab. Probably heard it as scab, but it's fusarium head blight. And the problem with it is that it has a vomitoxin or a toxin, mycotoxin called vomitoxin, which is aptly named. It makes animals that eat the grain vomit, okay? And in beer, it gives you what's called gushing, which if you've never seen is hilarious because you basically take a beer bottle and you spin it like six or seven times, throw the cap off and it's like a champagne bottle. It looks like Old Faithful just pouring out, okay? It's like all that carbonation has no way of stopping. So, I mean, to me, it'd be a great prank, but that's not the way I drink my beer, okay? So that's, that's the other one. But fortunately, we rarely see it here. And as we get drier, you see it even less. So that's where barley would fit in part in Nebraska. Okay, the benefits of winter barley in, in the Great Plains? Well, first of all, it has known markets. You know, this is one of the things that's, that's a little bit nice and that you can sell it as for malt. You can sell it as a feed grain. If you have a problem with either of those, you can hay it. You know, so you have a lot of choices. Okay. If you're used to growing small grains, the equipment's identical. 
You don't need new drills. You don't need new harvesters, that kind of thing, fertilized spreaders. It's all the same, okay? It is extremely drought tolerant. And in fact, if barley had a more consistent yield and better winter hardiness, I mean, and the winter hardiness is what makes the yield fluctuate, Nebraska probably would be a barley state. In most of the world, if you're under 60 bushel per acre in wheat, they grow barley. Our state average is probably about now about 45, 46, 47 bushels. The difference is, is we get a better price for wheat and we have ample winter hardiness, so there's less risk. Okay? But it's much more drought tolerant. So if you're growing under dry soils, this is what you'd really want to look at. Okay? And if you think about flexible rotations, barley fits in dry. So like if you're in a dry span of years, barley is what you'd be looking at. Okay? It's also the earliest of the small grains. It's earlier than winter triticale. It's earlier than winter wheat. So if you wanted something to come off quicker, you know, like you were talking about, you know, we're going to double crop the, the things and we were, the peas came off, we were planted, we double cropped after wheat came after July 8th. Usually barley's a week earlier than that. So if a week's important to you, you can come off earlier. Okay. One disease which we don't have, I don't like to scare you, but if I were in Texas, there's a disease in Mexico. It's a, almost a trade barrier. It's called carnal bunt. Came from India, province of Carnal, got into Mexico. Occasionally, the wind blows it across the border. When it came across the border, every combine in that part of Texas had to be steam, steam clean before they could bring the combine out of that. Uh, the seed had to be either destroyed or tested and all these kinds of things. Barley's immune to that. So if, every, if that disease ever breaks out and you wanted to say in small grains, you grow barley. Okay? Uh, some things that are really interesting is they're now using barley in hydroponics, where they literally grow it like, I guess, like sod, cut it up and feed it to cattle. And it's a very rapid turnover for winter feed. Okay? To me, it looks like it'd be high cost, but there are people selling it, and you'll see that. Potentially, maybe ethanol, though corn's a tough crop to beat on that. Okay, so, you know, as a professor, you got to give a little science, right? So let's talk about the history of barley so you get a feeling for how all these things work. Okay, 60 million years ago, there was what was called the poiety, okay? And 35 million years ago, they then diverged into an unknown progenitor, okay? It's completely lost, okay? From that unknown progenitor became we went through what's called a divergent evolution. So from 35 million years ago, there was the B genome, okay? The A genome, the A genome is Agelops uh, umbilatum, okay? Or uh, ovartum. The C genome, which is in jointed goat grass. The D genome, which is Tauchii, uh, Triticum Tauchii, Agelops corosa, they have different names. And the barley genome, 11 million years ago. Okay, so for your sake, wheat, modern wheat, if it's durum wheat, is the B genome, which is totally lost. We don't know what that is, crossed by the A genome to give us durum wheat, which about 10,000 years ago crossed with the D genome to give us bread wheat. So barley is part of that di same divergent evolution. So barley is highly related to winter wheat and spring wheat. The other crop that's highly related to barley and wheat is rye. And rye slipped off about 7 million years ago. So that's the history, just so you have an idea of where it comes from. That's important for me because that's where I get my genes from for future breeding. Okay. So if you ever want to see what a field of wild wheat, oats, and barley looks like, this is in the Golan Heights, occupied parts of Syria. And that's all wild wheat. What you can see down there, the wild oats, that's fine. The barley is actually shedded already. It shatters in the wild, and it would be in that same field. If you were curious, when you see a stand of wild barley that's a pure stand, it's seeded as a, at a higher rate than any commercial field of barley you'll ever see. And that's because even if you're getting one or two bushels per acre, it all shatters. 
We're planted on average one bushel, maybe a bushel and a half. This is three bushels all shattered. And you will see pure stands of wild barley in the Middle East. Okay. This is a, again, now this is this is different. This is a crusader castle. This is on the highlands in Syria. And it's called the Croc de Chevalier, which basically means the castle of the cavalry. Okay, Chevalier is the word for horse. It was conquered by Richard the Lionhearted, and you can see he put his two lions on the gate to come in. Okay? But that's not what's important. What's important is this castle's complete ruins, and you see that tuft of green, which you probably can't see very well. That's wild barley. That wild barley is totally crossable to the modern barley. Okay? And so if you're in the Middle East or, or Turkey or North Africa, you're driving down the road, you'll see wild barley the same way as we see wild grasses. So it's a very diverse, very tough crop, grows on a lot of different systems. Mainly spring. The winter is what makes it different. Okay? So what's the difference between winter and spring barley? Okay. Winter barley, it's planted in September, uh, just like winter wheat. Our optimal planting dates are usually September. It's harvested late June, uh, early July. It's pretty rare that our barley comes out after the 4th of July at Lincoln. Okay. Uh, concerns would be the winter survival, lodging. Again, remember, it puts everything into that head. So you've got this big weight on top of a very slender stem. Possibly scab, though that's very rare from what I've seen in eastern Nebraska. But it's also an unforgiving crop. You should plant it on time. You should harvest it on time. It's not quite as flexible as the, the wheat crops are. Okay, That doesn't mean we don't plant late. It doesn't mean we don't get good yields, things like that. The last two years, we've had major rainstorms. We've had a hard time getting our crop in on time. So we're planting two weeks late, three weeks late, four weeks late. Still works. Okay. Spring barley is planted basically as soon as you can get it into the ground. Okay. It's, you know, it's done like spring oats. And I think spring oats, if it was dry enough, you'd probably put in February. March would be perfect, okay? Uh, it's harvested later. Usually for us, when we were working with spring oats and spring barley, it would be harvested towards the end of July, okay? More middle to end of July, okay? The concerns for us are always planting it on time. You know, it's not unusual to have snow cover in, in March. Not unusual to have that when it melts to be too wet to get in, in in early April. So that's why we kind of like having the winter because it's usually winter barley because it's usually drier to plant, survives the winter. If you have a wet spring, it's just growing. You're not worrying about trying to get it in, okay? Uh, you can get heat stress because it comes off later, which gives you shriveled seed. That's important if you're using it as a feed grain, but it's really important if you're using it as a malting type. Plumpness is a huge criteria for them. A little more risk of scab, but not a lot, okay? Almost all the malting barley regions are north of us, so almost all of them are spring barleys, okay? Now, we talk about wild barleys. Almost all of those are spring barleys, or what we would call facultative. They're grown in the Middle East, in North Africa, Spain, Southern Europe. There's not enough winter so you can plant them in the fall. They'll survive the winter because there's no winter. So it's kind of like you have an extended spring. That's what a facultative type is. The winter barley is much rarer. Okay? And for us, it has to survive our winters. If you have ever worked with barley, think of Lazarus. Okay? Because every time I go out to my barley field, I think it's dead. Okay? And then it comes back. It really does. So a couple of things you'll see. You know, you go out to a field of wheat, and you'll see that the field looks completely brown. But if you sort of get down and you flip over the leaves a little bit, you can see there's a little bit of green. You dig down a little bit, there'll be a green stem. You go out to a barley field, and the leaf is completely dead. I mean, it really looks just there. That's if you're lucky. If you're unlucky, the leaves will be completely gone because they've died and they got blown off. So you come out to this completely bare field, and you think, well, what am I going to replant? Okay. 
don't give up on barley. If you're really worried about it, dig up a little bit of it, put it in a pot, and make sure you water it. You know, you don't want to kill it from drought and see if it comes back. That's the bioassay you would use to make sure it survived the winter. But barley, more than once, you'll come out to a field, think it's completely dead, and three, four weeks later, it's green, and then later on, it's yielding beautifully. Okay? It's like the surprise lily that way, if you're familiar with that plant. Okay? Now, with climate change, this actually, or if you, if you don't believe in climate change with the patterns warming, it may actually help you in barley. Because if its number one issue is winter killing, having warmer winters is probably okay. The other thing is, if you have a warmer fall, by planting a little bit later, which gives you more flexibility, you're going to avoid the barley yellow dwarf because the aphids aren't out and about as much. Okay? Now, the one thing that is difficult is that barley, when it gets going, goes fast. It's a real racehorse. Okay? So the issue becomes, you can have winter killing for a lot of different ways, but barley, if it breaks dormancy and grows too quickly, and then you get a hard freeze, the growing point is now above the surface. You've killed the growing point. You have to hope for secondary tillers coming from the crown. Okay? So the ideal germplasm would be one that doesn't elongate too soon. And we may be able to regulate that by photo period, which is by how long the day is. The problem with using photo period is that in an early season, you might get caught by holding it back too much so that it then gets into a hotter summer. Okay. Where do we test? We test basically Lincoln Mead and then it's Sydney, Nebraska. Uh, representing quite a bit of different rainfall areas. The other dots are where we test our wheats. Talked about winter kill. It's pretty obvious, right? That's what it looks like in the small plots, the missing field. I do like winter kill for one thing. I don't need statistics to separate them. And number two is you don't harvest a winter kill plot. There's nothing to harvest. So it doesn't get carried forward, okay? Now, I like to talk a little bit about the carefulness of when someone comes in and brings you seed from somewhere else and says, you should try it. It's a great barley in X, okay? So this is at Mead. Now, Mead is our most severe winter kill site. And if you want to see whether in line survives at Mead, you're more than welcome to come up and look at it too because we have our barley site there. You see the UNL winter barley? Most of it's there, okay? That's because we breed for that. Now you see the trial that's just lower than that and it says malting barley trial. Okay, that's the trial we grow for everybody else. Okay, and the three plots that you see in there is the local check from our program. Okay, so you have to be careful. I mean, if you want to learn from experience, make it somebody else's experience and let them have you see whether or not it survives. The other area over there called the bee cap, that was a barley trial with great diversity to see what winter hardiness they had. Not a lot of stuff in that either, right? Winter hardiness is rare. We fortunately have enough for us, and most people are coming to us to get theirs, but we also have a really good selection site to do that, okay? Different types of winter killing. One is pure cold temperature. That actually is pretty rare in Nebraska. It used to be a little more common. You know, occasionally we had things where it was like minus 26 in the winter. Yeah, I remember those days. And that could be true winter killing. But even then, remember, it's the soil temperature that determines winter killing. It's, and wind chill index, don't even think about that because that's how the wind affects your skin. So it doesn't mean anything. It's, it's real temperatures and it should be soil temperatures. You can have heaving, which is if your soil is moist, you know how rocks get pushed to the top? Small grains over the winter get pushed right out of the soil, same way those, those rocks do. That's rare because we don't have enough moisture most of the time, okay? You can have ice crystals form in the cell. That's pretty rare in Nebraska because we're not that wet going into the winter. The one we probably have is the desiccation winter kill, which is basically the plant is just exposed 
It's so dry that it sucks the moisture out of the plant, and that eventually kills it. But the one that worries me the most is breaking dormancy too soon. That's the one where it breaks dormancy in, in say, February. You know, it's totally vernalized. You need about 45 days, and barley actually has a lower vernalization requirement than wheat, so you probably can get by with lower temp well with milder temperatures and probably 35 days or maybe even less so it's fully vernalized probably by december 1st if you're planting in september and then it's just a matter of when does it break dormancy so you get a nice warm spell in february you could totally kill your barleys not because of anything other than it just started growing used up all of its winter reserves then got frozen out okay the most extreme winter kill I've seen in barley and, and in wheat was a year when we were 70 degrees at Hayes, Kansas on January 31st. We were 32 degrees on February 1st, zero on February 2nd, and minus 10 on February 3rd. Everything had broken dormancy, everything got frozen out, and it's like you took all your money out of the bank to go buy something, it all blew away and you had nothing left. That's what you have to worry about on barley. Okay? You can have winter hardy lines that are, don't require a lot of fertilization. Dick do, and then one of our lines, very winter hardy, but they only had two weeks of fertilization. They evidently had a long photo period thing. Okay? Now, I do want to show you what barley actually does look like. Okay? The best drone pictures I have are from 2017. So you can see the field of barley, the light green. That's what it looks like. Next to it is a field of wheat. Looks pretty equivalent, doesn't it, other than the color. And that's pretty much the case. The, the barley is a, is a beautiful crop when it survives the winter. And normally it does if you manage it properly, get it in on time, don't have any surprises over the weather. That's what it looks like a little closer with the drones. But, I mean, it's a beautiful crop. Absolutely beautiful crop. You can see a little bit of lodging going on. Barley, like I say, doesn't have quite as much uh, straw strength as wheat. But I mean, it's, it's, you can grow great stands of it. This is the vernalization. Okay, now in this case, you have a picture of, on your left, barley that's fully headed. That would be the left picture. Then you have one that is quite a bit later that was probably delayed by either not getting enough fertilization or having a very long photo period requirement. So you can see the difference in maturities, which can be extreme. We usually try to make them small. And then on the right is the triticale, which is a much taller crop. So you can have a nice comparison. And I'm not sure if you can see in the picture on the right, but those heads have freeze damage, okay? So what happened is they had elongated and when it was in the boot, we had a freeze. It, you know, the leaves generally are pretty tolerant. The stem is pretty tolerant. The flower isn't. And there's two things that happen. One is you can either damage that and literally hurt the, the flower, or worse, it can look great, but you sterilized it. The anthers are very sensitive to cold. And so I don't know if you've ever seen freeze damage in wheat where the field looks spectacular. You run a combine through it, and you're getting one to two bushel. And it's because there was no pollen to self-pollinate. That's what it is on the, on the extreme right for you. Role of climate. This basically is just showing you how in the last, I guess it's uh, 16 years, that we seem to be getting a little bit warmer in the Great Plains, which for barley is a good thing. Okay? And if it gets more dry, Barley is a much better thing, okay? So it means we have less risk now of growing barley than we once did. Okay? There are only two programs right now really breeding barley. There's the University of Nebraska. There's a USDA program at Oklahoma down at Stillwater. So we're the two major programs that are providing wheat, uh, providing barley, I should say, to the Great Plains. We're now seeing a lot of barleys being brought in from Europe because barley is a much bigger crop in Europe and they have a lot of European seed companies, mainly in wheat, and they want to see how their barleys are doing. So you're seeing some pretty good barleys being brought in that way. Okay. Our testing sites now, we have the three in Nebraska. We've added one in Kansas. We've added one in Oklahoma. So we can get a much better gradient to see where our barleys are actually fitting. 
learn a lot more about where the yield is and, and those types of things. Okay. A uh, couple of things that you should be aware of if you're interested in growing barley. The dairies really love barley for the hay and the forage. And as you see the California dairies moving out to more animal friendly states, the barley acreage is really increasing. So Oklahoma has a very animal friendly policy. The panhandle of Oklahoma is very dry. What do you need? A small grains that's drought tolerant, that's barley. So that's what you're seeing, okay? Uh, we always worry about can you be insured? That's one of the benefits of having a crop that actually is grown extensively somewhere else so you can get insurance, things like that. One of the things that's a little funny is that because there's so little yield record on barley in the Great Plains current, you can either have very high yields because the people who in there were early adapters and so and they really worked at it. You know, they're the pioneers. So sometimes the yields are on your best farms, which means your insurance is at a better deal than if you were growing with just average growers. Okay. And of course we're feed and malt deficient. And I believe in Nebraska we now have a farm to fork rule for malting that if you use locally produced malt and locally produced hops, there are tax benefits to make to foster the industry. Okay. So Great Plains barley, we have a unique set of testing environments. We have a unique market, but I think the main thing is for your sake, we have multiple markets. So if it doesn't meet specs for one, it can go to something else. You have to have alternatives. Okay. Um, we have a very important source for winter hardiness. We are the place where everybody comes to get winter hardiness. And we're one of the last of the breeding programs for the Great Plains. And we are a key link or shield between Mexico and the spring barley region, which means that there's a lot of diseases that start from Mexico and go north and then in the fall go from Canada back down to Mexico. Diseases mainly like leaf rust and stem rust and things like that. We're a shield that fits in between there. Now, I want to show you the three types of barley that you're going to be interested in. The one on the extreme left for you is a two-row malting type. Big, plump kernels. That's what the malting industry prefers. We breed a little bit of that. To me, it never has the yield of the one on the extreme right, which is a six-row barley. Okay, Smaller kernels, but it has a lot of them. Okay. For those of you interested in forage, the one in the middle is called hooded. What that is, is those awns, and you see you have awns on all three of these, or on the two left and right, they're converted to a very soft textured leaf, and it looks like the hood on a cape. So if you, if you could, had a close-up of it, you'd see that it literally, instead of being a full on, it just looks like someone had taken a, you know, like, a, like a piece of cloth, dropped it over the shoulders, tied it at the neck and then it would drape down. Very soft on an animal's mouth. That's the one that every forage producer wants, okay? So those are the three different types. We breed all of them. Just very briefly, our selection program, all I want you to understand is it takes us 12 years to produce a new barley, okay? So there's a lot of investment in time. The value of that is that we introduce the variation in the first year, and then we allow all that variation to separate out. And that's where we do our selections. And then after that, in the third part, we do all the evaluations. Okay? So it takes us 12 years. We can maybe shorten that segregation with using some new technology, doubled haploids. But I want you to understand that nothing that comes out of the program, ours or anyone else, is untested. Unless we send it to some place and say, try it. Okay. But we have 12 years in Nebraska environments before any of our stuff goes out. So it should make it through our winter. That's the main thing. Okay? That's what a barley cross looks like. The, uh, the sort of beige is the male that's dried up and dead. That's basically a six row barley. We've pulled off four of the rows so we can make the emasculation. This is what our barley head row harvest looks like. That's some of the equipment we use. That's our inbreeding and selection, making sure we're getting the right types.
That's what the barley yield trial looks like next to the wheat, but you can see it's a beautiful crop when it survives. This is what they look like at Mead, very winter, winter killing site. You can grow good barley. Now let's give you some real yields. Okay, so now one thing, I always report barley yields in pounds per acre. The reason why I do that is, how many of you know what a bushel of barley weighs? 48 pounds, right? What does a bushel of oats weigh? I think legally it's 32. I think that's the official weight. What's a bushel of corn? 56. What's a bushel of wheat? 60. What's a bushel of triticale? This is, that's the hard one. It's 48, okay? So if I report it in bushels, what does it mean? Unless you knew it was 48 pounds per bushel, you wouldn't know if we're talking about a corn bushel, a soybean bushel, an oat bushel, a wheat bushel, or whatever. So everything I report is always in pounds per acre so that you can see what it looks like. So if you look at the barleys, and if you come down, the two that are commercial out of this list is the P845, which, by the way, of our winter barleys is the closest to a malting barley. We still have a long way to go. And it's ranked fifth, 14th. And if you look at P954, which is the most winter hardy type, which means it tends to be a little bit later, it's, it's the lowest yielding. So the lowest yielding commercial one is about 56, about 3,600 pounds per acre, okay? The other one's maybe 3,750. We're now looking at, if you look at the top line, and this, by the way, is based on three years being tested at Lincoln, Mead, and Sydney. So we have, and Colby, Kansas. So you have Colby, Kansas, Mead, the winter killing site, Lincoln, which is a beautiful site normally for barley, Sydney, which is a tougher, drier site, and then the average. You can say that our best barleys are averaging roughly 90 bushels per acre. So that's what you're looking at. You're looking at yields of 4,000 pounds in a reasonable year. Lincoln tends to be the best site, okay? And so you're getting close to 5,000 pounds in some of your better barleys. We actually have, and that's again a three-year average, so we have years where you're actually up over 5,000 pounds. So I just wanted to give you a feel for what yields do look like. Now these are all small plots. Most growers can't you know, capture in a small plot what we can you know, when you go to a large field. But barley is a reasonable crop to grow. I mean, it's not like you're taking a huge yield hit. Okay? And if you put, converted those into wheat yields, the 4304, which is our best yielding barley, that would be a little over 70 bushel wheat. Just to give you an example for, I have to convert these things quickly, but it gives you a feel for, as a small grains producer, what are you looking at? So we always like to give this, this is how you grow wheat profitably, you know? Helps if you got an oil well, okay? But a good past is positively dangerous if it makes us content with the present and unprepared for the future. I've bred small grains at the University of Nebraska for 33 years. The easiest thing to do would be to kill the barley program because it's small acreage, that kind of thing. I still think you need alternative crops, you need alternative information, you need choices. That's why we kept it. This is the group that helps with all the harvest. With that, any questions? You're more than welcome to ask. Do you work directly with some of the micro series and getting molding ones to them? We hope to. We have some real champions in, in, uh, in the, in the microbreweries. And actually, you know, this is a little embarrassing to be talking about wheat or about barley. We do have one beer that's directly made by uh, Blue Bloods called Two Guns, and it's made out of our triticale, okay? And it's, it's, to me, it's a very nice seasonal beer, okay? That's what we'd love to do with, with all of ours. And actually, one of the challenges, that I, which, you know, there's a, a brewing con conference going on right now in downtown Lincoln. I think it's Lincoln. Maybe it's Omaha. I think it's Lincoln. Is we should challenge them to create a beer for the 150th anniversary of the University of Nebraska. But if you go to Two Guns, which is our Triticale beer, every, every can has a badge number because it's a retired policeman. That's how Blue Blood's got its name. The badge number is 0915. 
the Department of Agronomy's zip code is 68583-0915, okay? And if you turn it on the side, it's got a great science literacy, which is, you know, something like in, in police work, we're familiar with great pairs, Starsky and Hutch for the ladies, Cagney and, and Lacey, and the like. This beer is dedicated to teamwork between scientists and people that understand brewing. And so it's it's a it's a really cool little beer. Is what I like, you know. And I, you know, not often you get a beer, you know, that you can work with. I like. Okay, I leave the flavor and the taste to your own choice. Other questions? Yes. Which one uh, that the uh, NB one forty four twenty two barley juice? You know, this is something. Okay, so the question was, and I, I should I should remember to answer the question. I apologize. I missed on the first first question was, is do we work directly with microbrewers to try to foster the industry in Nebraska. The second question is, which barleys are good grazing barleys? And unfortunately, we haven't had the resources to really do that. Um, we probably are getting closer to that only because we work with really good engineers that are doing a lot of aerial photography. And so we can get you ground cover and that is used as an estimated biomass. So the question that, that, you know, I don't know if I, you know, Nathan's already taken up all the things, but a, a question would be for you, first of all, when would you want to graze? So is early emergence most important, you know, or do you want to wait till it's hayed kind of thing? That's, that's, you know, there's two different measurements of biomass. Um, but those types of questions, we don't have a good answer on. Okay, so the other question is, can you can you basically use this as a dual purpose barley, graze and then go to grain? The answer is, we probably don't know that, but my expectation would be yes, okay? Um, and the reason why I say that is that barley occasionally will get hailed and then it'll come back, okay? I mean, it, you know, it, it tillers profusely, okay? The one concern that I would have with that is you don't want barley to get too late. The only time I've seen stem rust and barley in Nebraska is when we had huge wind erosion. We basically blew the field. And so the barley flowered actually later than wheat. And it's out of 33 years, it's only happened twice. And that's where you see, tend to see stem rust come in because otherwise the barley the term is escapes. It, it grows to the point where it's, it, it's too late to be infected. But I'm sure you can graze it. I presume you can still get a yield out of that without a question. We don't have much data on that, but it would depend upon how soon you'd want to pull it off. You know, in, in uh, wheat, it's the hollow stem is what they use. We probably could look at that in barley. I mean, the stems are hollow, and it's, it's the same type of crop. So I would, I would assume you could. Okay. Yes. Okay. So the question was on seed treatment. It's going to be more specific. Well, we have in the audience an expert in in ag chemicals, Leo. I don't. I don't I'm not going to put Leo on the spot. But but basically, every seed treatment I've ever seen controls smut. I mean, it's like the wimpy disease. Okay. I mean, it's the easy one to control. It's not like some of these other things. Like if someone came to me and said, we got to control bacterial streak, I'd tell you, there's, you can't do it. You know, we're, we're talking about fungicides. Bacterial streak is bacteria. Fungicides kill fungi. They don't kill bacteria. But almost anyone would work. So we have used things like the old Vitavax when it was still legal. And I think, I'm not sure, it's, it's, it's banned now, isn't it? Or is it, or is it the additives in Vitavax are banned, maybe? There was some Vitavax Plus stuff. But anyway, the old Vitavax would take care of it. You know, any of your new seed treatments will take care of it. So I, I think, you know, what I would do is I would go out and find a seed treatment that is, uh, and just, just look, because I mean, with the interest in barley in Europe, every major chemical company has seed treatments that are on barley and are registered. And so you can easily get the data, but almost everyone you can think of would work. 
Yeah, I would just do it by price. But I would highly recommend that you do that because, you know, I can't treat everything in my nursery. And if you want to see what leaf or head smut will do, come to my nursery. All my advanced trials are treated, but my early generation, there's too much stuff. Okay. Yes? Okay, so the question was, vomitoxin in barley in Nebraska is historically not a problem, but in northern Kansas, in wheat, it can be a problem. And I don't want you to think that it's not a problem in Nebraska either. Vomitoxin in wheat and scab in wheat is a problem and can be. We've had as much as 40 parts per million in some of our experimental test plots. Now, that doesn't mean a thing to you. 40 parts per million sounds pretty trivial. But if I told you that the world codex for exports is two, per, two parts per million, we're 20 times over the world export market limit. And if I also told you that usually when you mill a wheat, you take half of the vomitoxin off because it's on the edge of the seed, and you have half of it, so you're one part per million. Okay, so you can say maybe you know, that's, the, that's the codex or the, the standard for flour right up until you get to whole grain products, which is the big growth industry. So now you're grinding the whole grain. So we do have that. The reason why barley historically is not a problem is because it flowers a week earlier than the wheat. So usually it escapes, okay? The only time I've really seen truly bad fusarium head blight, and you think I'm crazy, was I was out in Alliance, Nebraska, 10 inches of rainfall. They had a wet spring, and it came exactly as the barley was flowering. The wheat had no fusarium. The barley did. We had a couple of strips just to show the growers what it would look like. For those who are unfamiliar with fusarium head blight, it's all dependent upon moisture at flowering. Okay? So one of the ways to avoid fusarium head blight is to plant wheats that have different flowering dates. Rarely do you get three days of rain, mist, heavy fog, especially in Nebraska where we got such winds at one time. I think most of you remember, what was it, 16 or 15, where we had 17 inches of rainfall from May 15th to like June 7th. I, mean, it was, I was like waiting the whole time. That's when we had our worst scab. And even on that case, the barley was pretty good because it was on the tail end of its flowering by the time those rains really came in. Because we normally flower at May 20th at Lincoln for wheat. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, so the question was, they've they seen the same thing in corn. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the, what happens in the fall is you set the inoculum up. So if you have residue in your field, which we all recommend having residue in our field, if it rains, then the fusarium fungus will sporulate. And if it sporulates three weeks before you're flowering, it's getting all over the plant. So when the flower comes out, if the conditions are right, that's when it becomes susceptible. Yeah, it's, you know, the corn's not infected uh, in the fall. It's, it's that you have the inoculum ready in the spring for sure. Okay. Any other questions you'd like to ask? I had one question. Uh, sure. On the, and tw you showed the pictures of 2017. Right. And it looks nice and pretty, right? But if in 2017, we had that week in February that was 60 to 70 plus degrees. Um, it didn't get down to zero after that, but it got, you know, to 10, 12 degrees a few times, but it looked good and survived. So, I mean, is that within the realm of survivable or does it need to get colder than 10, 12 degrees for, um, cause I'm assuming it broke dormancy in that February. I mean, every, yeah. almost everything did. I, I think it just depends upon how long the dormancy was broken. And the other thing is how well do you recover? The thing that really hurts you, if, if you think about it, and this is true for wheat too, is we're pretty, pretty much fully vernalized by December, you know, certainly by January, okay? 
If you had a warm month in January and everything started to grow, if it's not being held down by the data length, okay, because that's the photo theory response, it would just grow. It'd be like a hay crop. And then you get frozen. So now you've used all that crown reserves. It gets killed. And the plant's going to limp. If it gets warm in March again, and it uses those reserves again, and then it freezes again, that's when you go out. Okay, so everything's, you know, it's like, it's basically like your checking account. You know, if, if you thought you were set up to have a great season and you put all your money into your crops and then you got hailed out, you know, you might be able to limp for a little bit, but the next, say you got hailed out again, you're screwed, right? You know, you've used all your reserves. There's nothing left. That's, I think, what happens with barley more frequently than in wheat. You know, that's part of the thing of, its, of this nature of this Lazarus. Completely burned down, everything's got to be stored. Then it grows, then it gets frozen. So it's, it's taken quite of its reserves. Then it grows again, then it gets frozen again. That's usually where you see it, is when you have just almost like a two-cycle killer. That's where you see it. Okay. Any other questions? Well, with that, again, if you're curious about barley, you're always more than welcome to come see it. Literally, we're just on 84th and Havelock. I don't know how until they get the event center road squared away, how you're going to get in and out. But we're just on the north side of the road. You'll see barley. You'll see triticale, which is a tremendous forage crop if you're interested in feeding. Its biomass is much larger than wheat, okay, uh, and a different growth pattern than the barley. And if you're curious, for those of you that grow rye, we actually do test hybrid rye for a European seed company. I can't imagine what the cost will be, so I doubt you may ever be able to afford it, but they are light years ahead of Elbon rye if you ever use Elbon rye, light years ahead of that. Okay? Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you. Let's give him a hand. Okay. Well, that's going to do it for today. Uh